What is a mutual fund? What are the different types of mutual funds out there? And what is the minimum amount of money you need to start investing in mutual funds? Answers to all of these questions and more coming up. Hello and welcome to Practical Personal Finance, where you get the information you need to understand and succeed with money. Today, we'll be covering the basics of mutual funds, and I'll be joined by Andy Panko. Andy is a certified financial planner and the owner of Tenon Financial in central New Jersey. He received his MBA from Rutgers University, and he's been in the financial services industry for over 20 years. When he's not busy helping his clients, there's a good chance Andy's tackling a new woodworking project or making video content for his YouTube channel, Retirement Planning Demystified. And now without any further delay, here's my conversation with Andy Panko. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for sharing your knowledge and expertise with all of us. I know our topic today is mutual funds, so let's start out with the most basic question of all. What is a mutual fund? So at a high level, it's a pooled investment vehicle where instead of buying a single stock or a single bond, you and hundreds, if not thousands of other investors all take your money, pool it into a big pot, and then there's a manager who oversees that pot that'll go then take all of that money and invest it in a collection of stocks, bonds, or whatever. Most of us are familiar with the concept of buying stock in a single company. Why might purchasing a mutual fund instead be a better idea? A few reasons. Basically, it's the ease, efficiency, and cost effectiveness of getting diversification. That's why you'd use a mutual fund. So an example would be, let's assume you only had $1,000 to invest and you wanted to buy some stocks. Well, there's some stocks where one share alone costs more than $1,000, so you can't buy any of that stock, let alone buying dozens or hundreds of individual stocks to get yourself a diversified portfolio of a whole collection of stocks. So by taking your $1,000, putting it into a mutual fund, again, it's this pooled concept where you and hundreds or thousands of other people all put your however much money in so that this collective pot is now hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, so there's this huge bin of buying power that can go out and easily and efficiently buy dozens or hundreds or thousands of individual positions. So you as a mutual fund owner own a prorated slice of that pool where your $1,000 can now get you potentially thousands of underlying investments, whereas you wouldn't possibly be able to buy those thousand investments by yourself with only that $1,000 purchase. I've heard you use the term diversification a few times now. What is diversification and why is it important? Yeah, diversification is extremely important. It's basically the concept of not putting all of your eggs in one basket or two or three baskets. Or let, Let's assume you own just one stock. That stock can theoretically go to zero if the company becomes bankrupt or it ends up there's accounting fraud or something. The share price can, can literally go to zero. In that case, you lose 100% of your investment. With diversification, you own dozens or hundreds of stocks, and even if one, two, or even a handful of those stocks goes bust and goes to zero, it's virtually impossible for all dozen or hundred of those stocks to all go to zero. So yes, you may not make as much, like a single stock can go up three, four, five, ten 10 times in value. A big collection of stocks, chances are it's not gonna go up potentially that much. But it's also virtually impossible for a diversified basket of dozens or hundreds of stocks to all go to zero. That's an end of the world scenario. If that happens, we have bigger problems. Um, but assuming that doesn't happen, diversification helps prevent extreme upside swings and also the extreme downside losses. What type of people are mutual funds best suited for? Frankly, mutual funds can be good for anybody. Again, because it provides cheap, easy, and cost-effective diversification. Going back to that example, it'd be really difficult for you, even if you had hundreds of thousands of dollars, it would be a lot of work to try to go pick dozens or hundreds of individual investments, manage them, you know, buy and sell, rebalance them to keep them in some sort of sensible collection of a portfolio. You can just simply buy one mutual fund if you wanted to, or a few, but the point is you're only buying a limited number of funds 
that makes it significantly easier to administer and invest your portfolio as opposed to you doing the, the picking of potentially hundreds of individual securities. So for that reason, really anybody can benefit from it. Whether you got a thousand bucks or a few million dollars, there's no good reason why mutual funds aren't going to work for someone in most cases. What are the different types of mutual funds out there? There's a few ways to, to classify and slice and dice them. Typically, it's by security type or instrument type. So there's mutual funds that invest in stocks. There's mutual funds that invest in bonds. There's other more granular forms of mutual fund you can pick, not just stocks, not just bonds. For example, some invest in commodities like uh, gas or oil or wheat or something like that. But generally speaking, it's going to be stocks or bonds. Now, within each of those, you can further subdivide in, in numerous different ways. So bonds, you can have bonds issued by federal governments. You can have bonds issued by corporations. On the stock side, you can have stock of small companies, of medium-sized companies, of large companies, of U.S. companies, of international companies, etc. So it really depends what particular type of investment or exposure you're looking for. That then dictates which type of mutual fund is, is best for you and your needs. Right, right. If I'm looking to invest some of my money in mutual funds, I can imagine there must be thousands of choices. So on the topic of determining what type of mutual fund is best for my needs, how might I narrow down my choices? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, part of it is the industry's fault for creating endless amounts of what's oftentimes virtually the same thing. There's hundreds of different companies that create and sell mutual funds. Most of the time, there's not a lot of distinction or differentiation between them. Different companies can more or less offer the identical product, just their own flavor of it with their own brand. So it makes it really hard as a consumer to filter through all of that and, and pick which company, which specific fund is, is the best for me. Where you would start is you need to figure out your general investment allocation. How much exposure do you want to stocks? How much exposure do you want to bonds? That's always the first step. Then from there, you figure out the instruments that most efficiently get you that exposure. Uh, whether it's mutual funds or individual stocks, that's partly personal preference, partly what your views are and whether or not you think you can do better picking your own investments as opposed to letting a, a mutual fund manager pick for you. And then once you decide, you know, let's assume you do decide you want to go down the mutual fund route, well, then you have to figure out which company do I get from? And that's partly driven by which particular strategy do you want? If you just want something what's called passive, where the fund just tries to replicate some sort of index, some broad stock or bond index, then fine. Then you know you want a passive fund and you go find there's dozens of companies that have passive funds. If you want a particular strategy that tries to do something special or unique, maybe that strategy is only offered by one or two particular companies. So that then guides your hand to say, okay, I want or need to buy a fund from this company as opposed to the other hundreds of companies out there. And then it comes down to also, you know, separate from strategy, it's uh, basically fees. Fees are important, which we can touch on. Also the pedigree or history of the company. There's lots of big fund companies out there we've all heard of. There's also some you've never heard of. Um, I don't want to say there's companies that are fly by night companies, but there's definitely smaller, less established ones that generally speaking, it's probably better to stay away from and go with the tried and true companies that have been around for decades and have you know, massive amounts of funds and, and assets behind them. Now, I heard you mention small companies and large companies being a differentiator between different types of mutual funds. Can you talk about some of the differences between large cap and small cap companies and how they fit into the conversation about mutual funds? So cap stands for capitalization. It's a fairly technical term, but capitalization just essentially means company size. So if you have a company that has 100 shares outstanding and each share is currently trading for $10 per share, multiply the number of shares times share price and that's $1,000. So that company's capitalization would be $1,000. Now, small cap means companies that are small capitalization or small size. Large cap means companies that are large capitalization or size. And then you have things in between, mid cap or medium cap or whatever name you choose to give it. Now, there's no, I don't believe there's hard limits as to what defines small versus large. Generally speaking, 
any company whose size or capitalization is under a billion or $2 billion, I believe, is typically called small cap. Anything, I believe, 10 billion or larger in, in capitalization is called large cap. And then the mid caps are somewhere in between. There's also at the extremes, there's micro cap stocks, which I think are generally a couple hundred million or smaller in size. And then there's what's called mega cap. Things like, you know, the, the, the behemoth names we've all heard of, we use their products, their capitalizations are hundreds of millions. If um, their capitalizations are well into the hundreds of billions, if not a trillion dollars, there have been some companies, I don't know if there are now, but there were some companies who capitalizations hit one trillion dollars. So those would be the, the mega cap names. What about the differences between mutual funds when it comes to what brokerage I might be using? So there's two companies to keep in mind when, when you invest in mutual funds. There's the fund company that actually creates and manages the fund. And then there's the company or broker or custodian through which you own the fund. Now this gets into how you buy mutual funds and there's, and there's two ways to go about it. One is you can buy direct from the fund company that creates and manages the fund, in which case that's the only party involved. It's you and that company. When you have $1,000 you put into the fund, you write a check or send a bank ACH transfer for $1,000, you subscribe to the fund and they, they tell you, okay, you now have $1,000 worth of ownership in this big pot of money, which is the fund. That's option one. Option two is you can buy a fund through a traditional broker, the same brokers that you can buy stocks and bonds through. In that case, you have the broker or custodian that you have your account with. You can buy funds through that account. So you may have a fund managed and issued by fund company ABC that you own through broker XYZ. So in that case, there's two parties involved. You're still ultimately invested in fund ABC, but you indirectly hold it through your account at broker XYZ. What's the minimum amount of money I need to start investing in mutual funds? That really depends on the fund company and the particular fund that you're looking at. There are some mutual funds that have zero minimum. So yes, you can write a check for $25 and buy into the fund. There's other funds that have $500, $1,000, some are three or $5,000 minimums. And then there's other, some funds have institutional classes or shares of the fund that are meant for larger, bigger dollar amount investments. They often have lower fees associated with them, but they have higher minimums, in which cases it may be tens of thousands of dollars, if not $100,000 plus to invest in those particular uh, classes of funds, but generally it's figure a few hundred dollars, maybe a thousand bucks for the, for the typical minimum uh, mutual fund. Are there any fees involved when it comes to buying and selling mutual funds? So the actual purchase or sale of funds could have two fees involved potentially. One is go back to the example of where you buy fund ABC through a brokerage account at broker XYZ. In that case, the broker you're buying through may charge a fee, just like some brokers charge fees to buy and sell stocks or bonds. That fee could be anywhere from zero, perhaps up to $50 or so per transaction, per purchase or sale of a mutual fund. If you buy without the broker and you, and you invest directly by just sending a check to fund manager ABC, there's usually no trade specific fees, there's, there's no $20 fee to buy and sell, but there are some funds that have what's called a load. A load is just a fancy word for a commission. Sometimes you have to pay a commission to buy into the fund. Sometimes you pay a commission on your way out of the fund when you eventually sell it. Now, 20 years ago, most funds had some sort of load to buy or sell into or out of the fund. Now, thankfully, most funds don't. There are, however, still some funds that have a load or commission associated with them, and it can be upwards of 5% or so. So for example, if you have an upfront load to buy into a fund and it's 5%, if you have $100 you want to invest in the fund, only 95 actually goes into the fund as an investment. The other five is paid to the fund company as that 5% uh, sales commission or load. I would say this day and age, there's really not many funds 
with loads where the strategy is so unique or the fund is so special that it's worth paying that load or commission to buy or sell the fund. So generally speaking, stay away from funds with loads and go to what's called no load funds, which are j just simply means there's no commission to buy or sell into or out of that fund. I've also heard the term expense ratios in relation to mutual funds. What should I know about expense ratios? So there, there's costs associated with creating, with running a mutual fund. So if you think about it, you and hundreds of people all pull your money into this pot. Someone's got to oversee that pot. There's the operational aspects of taking checks in, sending checks out when people want to redeem out of the fund. There's a day-to-day -day management of the fund. There's people who pick the individual stocks and bonds in the fund. All those things cost money. So the expense ratio is what's used to basically pay for those expenses. Now, it's, it's a little, I don't want to call it sneaky. The expense ratio isn't something you explicitly pay directly. It's baked into the fund and the value of your holding. So for example, if a fund has an expense ratio of 1%, that means each year the fund company is, is essentially taking 1% of the value out of your account and using it to compensate themselves for the fees and expenses associated with running the fund. So that's the expense ratio. It's always quoted as a percentage uh, and expense ratios range from some are zero or close to it on the high end is 1% or so. Some funds are even higher, which uh, is absolutely insane. But generally speaking, expense ratios of about half percent or so are common. Less than that is relatively low. Higher than that is fairly high. Is there anything else you think our audience absolutely needs to know about mutual funds? I think it's important to know that mutual funds make the investment management process exceptionally streamlined, easy, cost-effective, and efficient. Not to say you can't put together a good portfolio by individually picking a bunch of stocks and bonds yourself, but why would you? It's so much easier and more effective to just buy a mutual fund. You're basically outsourcing the process of someone else doing all the individual picking and administration of the fund. You just buy into it and kind of sit back and relax. Most people can get away with anywhere from one to four funds, and that's all they really need for their investment management. Because if you think about it, a fund could have hundreds if not thousands of underlying positions. You would never be able to practically manage hundreds or thousands of individual positions yourself, yet by buying into one fund, that's the beauty of it. You get exposure to a whole world of different investments that you can't possibly piece together on your own. Andy, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today and share some of your knowledge and expertise when it comes to the topic of mutual funds. If anyone would like to learn more from you, where can they find you? You can check out my website, Tenon Financial. That's T as in Thomas, E-N-O-N financial.com. I also have a YouTube channel, Retirement Planning Demystified. The content is focused mainly on those near or in retirement, but I do occasionally do some more generic finance and investing and tax videos there. So definitely check that out. And I have a great Facebook group, Taxes in Retirement. Again, focused typically on uh, content for people in or near retirement specifically with the angle on the tax planning and minimization aspects of financial planning. I want to thank my friend Andy Panko for taking the time to answer my questions about mutual funds. Do you have any other questions that we didn't cover? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, click right here to check out Andy's channel, Retirement Planning Demystified. And for more great content just like this, click right here to subscribe to Practical Personal Finance. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Andrew Shear, and I'll see you next time.